Anti-Israel groups in many countries around the world take a week at the end of February or in March and organize what is called the Israel Apartheid Week. And it is a big deal now, and it's spreading especially in the colleges and universities. And if you have any look at the videos of what goes on there, or if you've ever seen it yourself, it is thinly veiled anti-Semitism, and emphasis on the word thinly. But apartheid is defined as a political system where people are clearly divided based on race, gender, class, or other such factors. Now, as this is the Bible in the news, we must say that it was God in his divine wisdom who instructed his people, the Jews, to be separate from the nations around them. Regardless, applying this label to Israel today is a ridiculous suggestion. Welcome to the Bible in the News. This is John Billington with you this week. Now, we're not saying that the state of Israel is perfect. Far from it. In fact, I would say that um, really there are big issues uh, with what goes on in Israel today, although probably I would say that more for the way that they treat some of their own citizens, especially in the West Bank. Now, as far as Israel's Arab citizens are concerned, they have equal voting rights, including the women. A number hold seats in parliament, even though they support Hezbollah, although people are very upset about that. How do you have people in the Israeli parliament that are supporting Hezbollah, only in a place like Israel? And Arabic, like Hebrew, is even an official language. And you could go on and on about uh, about these these types of things. The fact of the matter is that the Arab citizens of Israel have it far better off than the Arabs in the nations around. And we can't help but add the fact that if you're looking for true segregation in Israel today, you're going to find it in the Arab cities like Bethlehem and Nablus, where the Jews are simply not allowed to go. Zero mixing. They are Jew-free cities. Jews are... Absolutely not allowed. And if a Jew makes a wrong turn and ends up there by accident, it very it may very well cost him his or her life. So, people don't like to talk about that. They like to talk about things that uh, they think they can, they can make an argument about. And not very many people, if we're honest, and we'll talk about this a little more, are actually looking for truth in the land of Israel. So, what they do is they... To show this great apartheid, the anti-Israel mob runs to Judea and Samaria, which is commonly known as the West Bank. And they say, oh, look at the great wall Israel's building. Look at all these checkpoints. Look at the soldiers and the security. It's simply like living in a prison. But this was not always the way it was. And prior to the second intifada, uh, things were much different. There was no wall. There was much less security, and Jews and Arabs mixed. When we, uh, when I went to Israel with my wife, going back some time, uh, you know, you, when you were walking along, the the Jews were extremely happy to buy from the Arabs and back and forth, and things were very different. Jews could go into the Arab cities. Um, things were a, a much different scenario. Now, incredibly, surprise, surprise, after many suicide bombings and terrorist attacks in the early 2000s, Israel added security. If any other country in the world was dealing with sniper fire and had people crossing into their borders to become suicide bombers, they too would add security checkpoints and walls. It's outrageous to suggest otherwise. But during that time, it was so bad that many of the Jewish families living in Judea and Samaria would not travel with both mom and dad in the car, because if they were attacked, they did not want their children to grow up as orphans. Oh, and that, you know, it, honestly, not exaggerating. This is, this is the truth. And here's a, here's a quote to show you what it's like uh, to live in those areas. This is from the book uh, God, Israel, and Shiloh, uh, written by David Rubin. Uh, and he says, just taking a brief walk in my neighborhood in Shiloh, and Shiloh is just is uh, is north of uh, Jerusalem, just off the the main highway. 
I think it's route, I think route 60. But uh, he says, just to, uh, taking a brief walk in my neighborhood in Shiloh, we come to the house of the Yerushalami family, whose 17-year-old son Shmuel was killed in a bus bombing. Several houses farther, farther down the block lived Shmuel's friend, 17-year-old Avi Sutton, murdered by terrorists who killed Avi and several other classmates who had been playing on or near their high school basketball court. On the same street as the Kelser family, immigrants from the United States, whose 19-year-old granddaughter, Gila Sarah, was also killed in a bus bombing. Just around the corner is the Shoham family, whose five-month-old baby, Yehudi, was killed by a rock thrown at his head as he and his parents were driving back from a visit to his grandparents' house. He was resting comfortably in his infant seat when the car was ambushed and the poor baby's fragile skull was smashed. The doctors tried val valiantly to revive him, but he died of his wounds after a several-day vigil in the hospital intensive care, unit, uh, uh, intensive, intensive care unit. Walk down the hill from the murdered baby's home, and you come to the Apter family, whose son Noam was in the kitchen in his yeshiva, which is a religious uh, seminary, which combines military service with religious studies. And he and th uh, three other fellow students were preparing for the Sabbath meal for all the other boys who were sitting in the adjacent dining hall. Suddenly, two terrorists from the Islamic Jihad terror organization burst into the kitchen, shooting and wounding Noam and the others. Before Noam fell dead on the floor, he reached out and locked the door to the dining hall and threw away the key, thereby saving the lives of close to 100 boys in the dining hall. These are only a few examples of the many children of Shiloh who have been killed or wounded by the fanatical Islamic terrorism that we are all facing. I find those words sad and shocking, and living in Canada, I just feel so far removed. But I think you can see the character of the people that are being developed there is going to be incredible. But I think the words of Psalm 120 are very appropriate. Verse 6 and 7, My soul hath long dwelt with him that, hath, that hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And the truth is, you can't make peace with this type of person or people. And when this type of thing is going on, how, how on earth is there going to be peace that comes out of it? However, the incredible thing is that in the world's eyes, the terrorism is somehow justified, as they say the Jews unjustly took the land from the Arabs in 1967. But in reference to the 1967 war, I think the following from the Jewish Virtual Library makes it very clear. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol sent a message to King Hussein saying Israel would not attack Jordan unless he initiated hostilities. When the uh, Jordanian radar, radar picked up a cluster of planes flying from Egypt to Israel, the Egyptians convinced Hussein the planes were theirs. He then ordered the shelling of West Jerusalem. It turned out the planes were Israel's and were returning from destroying the Egyptian air force on the ground. Meanwhile, Syrian and Iraqi troops attacked Israel's northern frontier. And it carries on. Had Jordan not attacked, the status of Jerusalem would not have changed during the course of the war. Once the city came under fire, however, Israel needed to defend it, and in doing so took the opportunity to unify the city, ending Jordan's 19-year occupation of the eastern part. And they didn't just get Jerusalem when, when the Jordanians attacked. Um, they ended up getting, that's when they got the, uh, the whole of the West Bank. Now, you can be as upset at Israel for defeating the Jordanians who attacked them as you could be at David for defeating Goliath. But the world is not just upset. They are seemingly furious and determined to reverse this history. Uh, and the level to which Israel's haters will go should not be underestimated. This week, an extreme left-wing organization named Breaking the Silence uh, is in the news. The organization's purpose is to interview Israeli soldiers and ultimately dig up any dirt they can on Israel for the purpose of undermining and discrediting the state. 
Organiza organizations like this are in abundance, but what put breaking the silence into the news that of its $1.8 million budget, 78%, now of that $1.8 million, I think it is, but that's from 2012 to 2015, I, I, uh, from what I can tell. But uh, still, it, it, it's a, it's a, that's, that's a big budget for, for doing what it does. Uh, but 78% of its budget came from European governments, including Switzerland, Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden, France, and the EU. Now, I was, I, it's, it seemed crazy uh, that the EU would fund an organization like this, but I went and did a little more digging, and what I found was interesting, but maybe not surprising, and that was in 2014, uh, the largest donor was uh, an organization I'd never heard of, Miserior, if I, if I said that right, it's spelt M-I-S-E-R-E-O-R. -E -E but I went and looked that up, and it was the German Catholic Bishops Organization for Development Cooperation. And uh, I got that right off of the, this um, Breaking the Silence website. Uh, they had a financial statement on there, which I was able to uh, download and go through. And, I mean, we could discuss more that's on there, but, I mean, that was one of the biggest donors that I could see in 2014. And it's the German... Catholic bishops, it's, anyway, they, I mean, now, what made this even more scandalous is that they uh, have been infiltrated by a whistleblower, and it was coming out in the news, uh, now, I have to be honest, I'm talking about this week, but Bible in the News is a little bit late this week, so it was actually last week, um, but they've been infiltrated by a whistleblower, and uh, it's come out that they're doing more than just trying to sway some opinions. Uh, and they are now being investigated for espionage against the state of Israel. And this is funded by none other than the European governments and um, the German Catholic Bishops' Organization. There is no doubt that Europe is against Israel and is led by the Vatican. And the Vatican is the one who took 45 years to recognize the state of Israel. And I was one of the uh, one of the last in the world to do so. Uh, surprising they ever did, I suppose. But they recognized, quote unquote, Palestine before it's even a state. This is to be expected when we look at the words of Second Thessalonians chapter two, which clearly speak of the Roman Catholic system. If we don't have time to go into all of Second Thessalonians two, it'll be in the Bible magazines on the Bible magazine website www.biblemagazine.com. Uh, uh, go look in the back issues and there's uh, lots of information I don't have an actual issue here sorry about that but if you go look it up it'll be there uh, Second Thessalonians 2 clearly speaks of the Roman Catholic system which has uh, grown, uh, grown from a corruption of the true gospel message and the seeds of this corruption go all the way back to the time of Paul himself as he says in verse 7 for the mystery of iniquity doth already work all of this happened, Paul says, because they received not the love of the truth, verse 10. And when we look at how this system handles the Bible, they've done everything from burning them to uh, distorting the message, we should not be surprised by how it treats and views God's people and distorts the truth about them. Again, we could say much, much more about this. But unfortunately, it's not just the Vatican, although I believe she leads the charge, the majority of the world is now against Israel. And all you have to do is go to the UN and look at the votes that they take against Israel, which is about all they seem to be able to do. And even in America, where they will often stand up for Israel under the leadership of Obama, the US has been highly critical of Israel and building of settlements. But, uh, which to me is another outrageous thing. I mean, you're against the building of settlements. I mean, what do you want them to do? I mean, do you act? I mean, pe people are still talking about a two-state solution, like it's actually something that is viable or would have any bring any level of peace to the region. It would be even take the Bible, take everything that God is doing in that land, put that to one side, even on a completely natural level, a two-state solution. Go have a look at the Gaza Strip and see how well it works. But it people, you know, they they don't care. Um, but if, yeah, I mean, if you look at, and if you look at the map and say, okay, let's give them the West Bank, it's impossible because they would never be, you know, Israel could not defend itself with that type of a, uh, a split up map. But as I say, few care and, uh, about as many cared about 
you know, Israel when they struck the Iranian nu- uh, nuclear deal. However, back here in Canada, it, you know, it's not far from pro-Israel like it was, uh, you know, less than a year ago, uh, there's been a change of government, and the Liberal Party was voted in, and under the previous Conservative government with Stephen Harper as Prime Minister, it was considered one of the most pro-Israeli governments in modern times, and they stood up for Israel on the international uh, international stage, and especially at the UN, to an unprecedented level. But knowing that Israel has so few friends, it is sad to watch the new government back away from a pro-Israel position. And the truth is, I mean, now and again you get a leader that will stand up and and say, you know, the right thing for uh, for a time. But long term, it uh, it it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't last. Now, it must be said if you've been watching the news for the last couple of days, and especially uh, on Monday. If you saw the news coming out of the APEC conference with all the U.S. presidential hopefuls speaking, it seemed like they were trying to just simply one-up one another on how pro-Israel they were. They were, uh, But the truth is that it would be nice for Israel to have a friend in the world, but in most cases it's far more talk than action. And especially when um, the help you do get is just them trying to make you give up your land as it happened i mean that was the, it was the same under george w bush and uh, long before so when we look at the prophecies though in the end it is clear unfortunately that no one is able to stop the northern invasion of ezekiel 38 well no one that uh, would be considered a human ally of israel i mean about all they are able to do in ezekiel 38 is is question why the northern invader has come down. And the Jews have a history of few human allies, and in the end it will not be a human power that delivers them. When the northern invasion comes on Israel, it is no doubt that they will feel very lonely. But the help that will come will be more than any country could offer. And the words of the prophets are quite clear, and in particular the following words from Joel 3, verse, I'm, using, I'm going verse 1, 2, and then uh, verse 16 and 17. For behold, in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, gorgeous, I love it because that's now, that's today, the captivity, these people are back. He says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. If we have any doubt how God feels about Israel, yes, they may have lots to learn, but if that's if you want to know how he feels, there you go. They're his people and his heritage, whom the nations, it says, have scattered, uh, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have parted my land. You want to fight over the land? There, there's whose land you're fighting over. The Lord shall... And this is jumping to verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Israel, my holy mountain. And then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall be no strangers that pass through her any more. There's nothing like a little surprise for the world, and especially for the Vatican and those participating in the Israeli, Israel, uh, Israel Apartheid Week. What could be better? As Psalm 2 says, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord, may, the Lord shall have them in derision. It's disheartening when you see Israel being left alone in the world on, you know, to some level, whether the next U.S. president will sort of Uh, graciously help them for a time, we will see. They should, but so should every other nation in the world, and the time will come where they do. I mean, the prophecies are clear. You know, they will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, hey, can I come with you? I mean, we've heard God's with you. Things are going to change. But right now, it is not easy to watch, and it's not going to get any easier. The world is going to continue to turn on Israel, and the anti-Israel sentiment will continue to grow, especially we would expect it in Europe and in Russia. Uh, It is when we go into Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11, 
the character of the King of the North is definitely viciously anti-Semitic. And it's talking about in these chapters, you know, 8 and 11 of the Roman power. And as you go back through history, it has always had that anti-Semitic element to it. But we've long run out of time for today. So we'll leave it at that. And may the day come soon when the Lord will roar forth for his people and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Thanks for joining us and join us again I could say next week, but it may be later this week, as we're a little bit uh, behind. And we apologize about that, but thanks for joining us. Take care and come back.